Baby, that's a road trip. Welcome to your Thursday episode of Locked on Raptors. On today's show, we're going to dig into the 103-100 win over the Los Angeles Clippers last night to clinch a 5-1 Western road trip for the Toronto Raptors. Opens up a whole new world of possibilities when it comes to the standings. We're also going to talk about how the Raptors' defense has really come around. It seems like it's fully back and operational. That's very exciting. We've got some box score notes to go through as well. Going to hand out some flowers to Pascal Siakam, Precious Achua, and more. Plus, we've got the dude of the game, and we are going to take a look at the standings and the picture. How can the Raptors climb further up the standings and out of the play-in game? All that on today's episode of Locked on Raptors. You are Locked On Raptors, your daily Toronto Raptors podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey, what's going on? Welcome to episode number 1140 of Locked On Raptors for Thursday, March the 17th. Happy St. Paddy's Day to those who uh, pretend they're Irish today. I'm your host, Sean Woodley of RaptorsHQ.com. You can find me on Twitter as always at Woodley Sean. You can find the show at Locked On Raptors, and you can find the podcast free and available on all your favorite podcast platforms. Please go subscribe, follow, rate, review, etc., much appreciated plus you can go to youtube and hit the big red subscribe button over there we're now over 1700 subs which is wonderful thank you so so much to everyone who has subscribed and uh please continue to keep the numbers moving up let's get the 2k by the playoffs baby uh and as always a big thank you for making us your first listen of the day all right on today's show it's good vibes all around the toronto raptors are 39 and 30 tied with the cleveland cavaliers with the sixth seed in the Eastern Conference. They, of course, are in seventh because of the tiebreaker that the Cavs hold because of that stupid Christmas Day game or Boxing Day game where the Raptors had no players who had just met before the game took place. But I'm not mad about it. It's fine. Uh, they, they, they haven't beaten the Cavs all year anyway, so it doesn't really matter. Either way, they're right there with the Cavs. A week ago, they were three games back in the loss column. Now they are all evened up, and they are looking for more. You've got the Chicago Bulls kind of flailing right now, too. We're going to get into the standings picture to close out the show. We're also going to hand out some flowers to some excellent performers in the game against the Clippers in the box score note section of the show. But we first should dive into the big takeaway from this one. And the big takeaway from this game for me is that the Raptors defense is quietly very much back or, or maybe it's arrived. Maybe back is the wrong way to phrase it because, you know, the Raptors have kind of struggled defensively uh, all season long in fits and starts. And it's never really kind of come into be this sort of full and realized vision of what this Raptors defense can be. But they've been quietly making their way up the standings and in the overall charts is when it comes to defense. Their offense has also kind of tailed off a little bit from the top 10 status it was at for most of the year. And now defense is kind of the thing this Raptors team does best. And I think last night was a really good example of it. You know, the game was ugly. It was nasty. The Clippers, shout out to them, man. Like, they are uh, a real pain in the ass team to play, much like the Raptors are. I think the Raptors just kind of have more talent as they're currently constructed with no Kawhi, no Paul George, no Norm Powell for the Clippers right now. I mean, they're going to be a problem when those guys are back because they defend like maniacs. They're long. They're mean. They throw elbows in the best of ways. Like, that was a kick-ass game last night. Really, really fun and gross and grimy and full of guts and blood and sweat and all of that good stuff. Um, but the Raptors, you know, the, the, their defense was right up to the task of matching up to the Clippers, who are a top-10 defense in the league this season. They currently sit in the number eight slot overall. They're just at a seventh. Like, they're a really, really tough and stout defensive team. They have to be because they don't have a ton of offensive talent right now. But the Raptors matched their defensive level wonderfully the entire night. And they won this game, I think, because of their defense in the fourth quarter. Uh, you know, there were some moments here and there where things got a little bit tricky. Reggie Jackson had some pops. You know, Scotty Barnes kind of getting switched out onto him on the perimeter a few times uh, was kind of getting cooked in those situations. But for the most part, you know, the Raptors held up exceptionally well, forced really difficult shots all night long. And really helped overcome what was a bit of a sloppy finish to this game on the offensive side of the ball to pull this one out. 
just to kind of go back to the the play by play of where things were at in that final minute or so, or even more so than that. But like the, the defense, I thought in the final minute plus was what really kind of stood out here. Um, you know, the, the Raptors offense was kind of grimy. It, you know, you had a really bad turnover by Scotty Barnes. You had a lot of possessions down the floor where, you know, the zone was still kind of working for the Clippers. They stuck with it for a very long time. And even upon like the return of, uh, you know, Pascal Siakam to the lineup and things like that, the Clippers stuck with it. And it was really tricky for the Raptors to try to penetrate it. But it's OK because their defense on the other end eventually kind of came around and there were some really swarming and difficult possessions down the stretch that got the Raptors over the line in this one. You know, you factor in as well that you have, you know, the huge tap uh, of an offensive board by Scotty Barnes, the many, many free throws that Fred Van Vliet got to attempt, only hitting half of them, which kind of made things more difficult than you needed. And then you have Precious Achua, uh, who was told to foul on the final possession of the game with the Raptors up three you know, trying to avoid that potential game tying three, the coward's way out, frankly. I'm actually proud and happy that Precious Achua did not, uh, you know, give in to the lamest rule in basketball, which is like the obvious thing to do, which is to limit threes in those situations, but to foul and, and like take away the opportunity of a potential buzzer beater, that sucks. That's dumb. It's bad for entertainment. That shouldn't be allowed. And I'm glad Precious Achua made a stand against it by just saying, you know what? Uh, I'm going to guard Marcus Morris and put him in jail and uh, he's going to put up a horrible shot that doesn't even have a chance of getting within three feet of the rim. And he did. And it was awesome to see. Uh, you know, again, all night, all, all, through, all through the night, there were stretches where the offense really struggled. Um, you know, there were moments where they were going with these like really, really healthy skelter bench groups. Uh, you know, Scotty Barnes playing alongside like uh, Thad Young and Chris Boucher. And uh, what was the other parts of that lineup? I had it written down here. It was Barnes, Boucher. Uh, you had Thad, Precious, and Armani Brooks was in there. The late third quarter stretch of this game where Armani Brooks was like missing all these wide open threes they were creating out of the zone. Uh, really kind of broke my soul. I was just rooting for Armani Brooks big time. He seems like a cool dude. The Raptors just signed him to a second two, uh, 10 day contract. Seems like he's going to be around for the rest of the year, probably just as extra guard help for a team that needs it. Uh, but to see him brick those super duper wide open threes was disappointing. But even then, you know, the team didn't lose those long stretches of minutes without their main guys on the floor all that badly early in the first half they lost a stretch eight to seven at the start of the second quarter not a bad stretch at all in the interest of getting guys like fred and siakam and trent some rest uh you know they, they didn't all played a lot of minutes anyway so it's uh, you know it's a little bit defeats the purpose i mean fred only played 36 which is actually kind of a win siakam 39 actually kind of a win so maybe the point stands um but and then the fourth quarter came around and the raptors you know at the start of that quarter it was gross it was grimy but they were really, really good on the defensive end with that lineup I just laid out, despite not having really any juice on offense. There were a couple moments here and there. Fred or Scotty knocked down a three. That was big, uh, kind of right out of the gate in the quarter. Uh, Precious had a beautiful drive, take, and finish. That was great to see. Other than that, though, not much in the way of juice from that lineup, but they only lost those minutes minus two over the course of almost four minutes at the start of the fourth quarter. And then you have your big guns come back in, Pascal Fred, and that kind of was what solved for this game for the Raptors. They immediately go on a 10-2 run, pretty thrilling stuff, and the Raptors end up uh, never looking back. So again, the, the rebounding, the, the the defense, like really, really good stuff. The rebounding actually was not a good thing. Uh, <laughs> they gave up a, a lot of uh, very bad offensive rebounds, got bailed out a couple times, Not did not get bailed out some other times, but overall I thought their defense was just really, really smothering in this one, and they took advantage of a team that doesn't have a ton of offensive juice, uh, you know, the Clippers still shot reasonably well, they, they, but that was a lot of, you know, second chance opportunities, things like that, kind of filling in and, and upholding their numbers. Overall, though, just, you know, the Raptors continue a trend of being a really solid defensive team. If you go back oh, over now 21 games, I've got it sorted back here on my stat sheet back to, Mar uh, to February the 1st, where the Raptors were around 25 and 23. They were kind of, uh, you know, kind of in the midst of uh, figuring themselves out, right? Kind of at the tail end of that January where things really turned around for the team. There was a bit of a February lull. Uh, but even then, since then, they're 14 and 7. Uh, their defense is now number 7 in the NBA over that time. And they are a team that is uh, in the top or top 11 in net rating overall. Their defense has been their star. Their offense in that stretch is all the way down at 17th. 
Uh, we've seen the spells. It's not gone super well at points. They have enough to get by, it seems, and they actually get better in crunch time in offense because they seem to just spam their best stuff more often than not. Didn't really work last night against the Clippers because, again, that's kind of a different type of defensive team. But uh, overall, the defense has been on a great stretch here over the last little while, and it's been kind of like their best crunch time like weapon in a lot of these games, right? You think back to the Phoenix game, for example. You think to the Nuggets game, the way they made Jokic's life miserable in that fourth quarter. Like they're playing the swarming all over the place, overwhelming arms everywhere style, and they've actually seemed to have learned how to execute it properly. They, they're they're kind of they're rotating on a string. There's backline help. The Precious Achua arrival has really really helped things uh, get shored up at the back end because he's always kind of there doing the verticality thing. You know, contesting shots, altering shots, making things more difficult for people. Uh, you know, the, the, it just seems to have really kind of finally gelled and set into place. And this is happening right now without OG Ananobi for the last little while. And you have to imagine things are only going to get better once OG is back. You know, this isn't a situation where you're going to add someone and it's like on offense where you're kind of, oh, well, this is difficult. What am I supposed to do? Uh, you know, my role has changed. Defense, you kind of just slot OG back in and he just becomes a guy who knocks everybody down a peg in responsibility. And you're not going to have situations where Scotty Barnes is on the perimeter guarding Reggie Jackson in a big moment. You're not going to have those types of moments. And instead, OG is going to be your dead ringer you can throw on the best offensive player for the other team. Like, I guarantee you, had he been available last night, He's getting the Reggie Jackson assignment and he's swallowing him up the way he has countless other big big and or small guards and wings so far this season. He's just been that good, that all-encompassing. And to throw him back into this mix with a with a group that is now seemingly kind of understanding where it is, maybe you move Scotty to more of a free safety role where he's been fantastic, kind of where he won the Suns game on Friday, for example. Um, you know, that is a pretty enticing thing to me. You've got Precious Achua, obviously, uh, in the back line there. Ken Birch has come around defensively as well. He was quite solid last night. It just seems like all these guys have kind of found themselves on that end, and the Raptors overall have been a top 10 defense for now a month and a half, which is uh, really, really important. And I think something we kind of expected at, at the start of the season that the defense would eventually kind of outpace the offense. Uh, that's happening now. You know, overall in the season, it's still 14th in defense or offense, 13th in defense, but it's been going uh, one way and the other thing's been going the other way, if you understand what I'm saying and the weird finger gestures I'm doing on the video. Either way. Uh, yeah, that, that's kind of it. The defense is back, baby. And that bodes well for the Raptors as they continue on to go forward here. It obviously helps their transition game, which has been a huge thing. Uh, you're seeing it in crunch time as well, where their crunch time uh, defense has just been overwhelming. They're getting out on the fast break. They're currently scoring more points in crunch time uh per 100 possessions on the fast break than any other team at 12.8 uh they are obviously killing the second chance points too that's not really defense related but it helps <laughs> overall anyway in those crunch time moments and they're forcing uh, other teams are scoring uh the sixth fewest uh fast break points uh, in the crunch time against them which you know kind of speaks to the way that they're finishing off possessions the way that they're uh you know preventing transition from taking place despite playing with their offensive rebounding heavy thing like I, it, it makes no sense that they've been able to suppress transition while also sending five guys to the glass more or less every single time down but it's been uh yeah it, it's been really really fun to, to watch this defense kind of coalesce and figure itself out and become a real weapon for this team late in games again as it's kind of been for the last few years you think back to 2019-20 that team's whole calling card was yeah good luck in a close game against us our offense will be good because we're going to run that Siakam Lowry pick and roll in whatever version we want to use it but really, where you're going to die is that you're not going to get a single look off of us over the course of the final three minutes of a close game. And that's going to do you in. And that was more or less the case last night outside of a couple of Reggie Jackson flourishes and a couple of Nick Batum lucky bailout threes that kind of floated to him after a few, uh, you know, difficult um you know, the, the, the missed offensive rebounds or defensive rebounds, things like that. Either way, uh, defense is back. That's the fun thing. We're going to continue on with the show. We're going to dive on the other side into some box score notes. We're going to hand out some flowers to Pascal Siakam, talk about Precious Achua, talk about a few other guys coming up in just one second here. But first, want to tell you about our friends over at Athletic Greens. I started taking Athletic Greens last week. They sent me a package when they became our new sponsor, and I got to tell you, it is wonderful knowing that there is a like a, an insurance for nutrition. I'm someone who tries to eat well at times, but I have a sweet tooth. I have an indulgent side, and I know sometimes I'm not getting all the proper nutrition I need because I'm eating garbage. It's just not what we need. And so 
I am really, really glad that Athletic Greens is here because one scoop of the delicious Athletic Greens AG1 formula, you're absorbing 75 high-quality vitamins, minerals, whole foods, super source, superfoods, probiotics, and adaptogens to help you start your day right. This special blend of ingredients supports your gut health, your nervous system, your immune system, your energy, recovery, focus, and aging, all the things that matter for the day today and you've got uh lots of wonderful reasons to check it out of course it's the price it costs you less than three dollars a day you're investing in your health and it's cheaper than your cold brew habit it's cheaper than getting all the different supplements yourself as well there's nothing worse than having a million different pill bottles to try to get all the right stuff you need and you're still not getting all of the stuff you're getting with ag1 and athletic greens was founded by someone who was a health nut who was an outdoorsman who was feeling like he was doing everything he needed, eating all the things he needed to be healthy, but he wasn't getting proper nutrition. And the doctor said, man, you got to figure this out. And so he figured it out himself by coming up with the AG1 formula. It's, uh, you know, it's a wonderful, wonderful thing. And his old sort of regimen to get all those vitamins into him used to cost him a hundred bucks a day. He created Athletic Greens to make it so he was not spending that kind of scratch to have proper nutrition. Again, it's the ultimate daily insurance. You have to go check them out at Athletic Greens. They're going to make it easy for you as well. They're going to give you a free one-year supply of immune-supporting vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. All you got to do is visit athleticgreens.com slash NBA network. Again, that's athleticgreens.com slash NBA network to take ownership over your health and pick up the ultimate daily nutritional insurance. Athletic Greens, go check them out. All right, we continue on today's episode of Locked on Raptors, your first listen of the day, of course, and we are going to dive into some box score notes, hand out some flowers to some guys who performed quite well. We got to begin with Pascal Siakam, who was just unbelievable last night. It, it actually wrote down in my notes in the first quarter. There was a couple moments there. He was kind of getting uh, guarded pretty heavily by Nick Batum. And look, the, the, the Clippers are super switchy. It's not really like they have one guy guarding anybody. They're long. They have similarly sized guys. They're kind of like a less offensively talented version of what the Raptors are trying to be, honestly. Like they're long and switchy. They're a little bit less aggressive than the Raptors are, of course, but they make up for it uh, by just being mean and being in place and being able to hang with guys who are smaller than them. Isaiah Hartenstein, for example, had some nice moments in that department. Um, but, you know, for the most part, Pascal Siakam was fine. I, again, there was a moment in the early part of the game where I think Nick Batum kind of bumped him off the spot a little bit. He almost tapped the ball out of his hand. It was like, oh, no, like he's got those active hands that sometimes can bother Siakam when his dribble's a little loose. And instead of feeling overwhelmed by the length and strength of Nick Batum, he just uh, took it and did a little pull up and boom, uh, cash. And then I, I felt kind of good from there. And he really did kind of alter the way he plays you know he's a guy who's been so much living at the rim this season he's finishing at the rim incredibly efficiently like over 70 percent. he's been that good around the basket and he in this game was like all right well it's not coming to me super easy on my drives there's lots of arms they're switching it's a really difficult thing for me to carve open so let me try to soften things up by knocking down jimmies and he did that he was three of five from downtown in this game talked after the game about how he wants to keep on kind of continuing on with the the three-point volume and making that a part of his game a little bit more prevalent um you know we, we saw him take a lot of mid-range jumpers as well the jab step stuff the 18 footers uh like all of that kind of helped soften things up and then eventually he was able to find those alleyways to get to the basket uh you know we only got to the line for one trip just two 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 attempts in this game you know, you want to see something more than that. You know, we can get into the referees if you want. I'd prefer not to because I feel like the referee conversation about that game was toxic as hell. Uh, you know, it, should I get? Yeah, well, let's get into this. Uh, you know, there, there's like there's hating the refs. There's being mad at the refs. And then there's like very clearly uh, pinpointing Natalie Sago as like the only ref who's doing bad things. Uh, and look, maybe some bad calls in there for sure. Uh, I feel like a male ref is not getting the same kind of constant, uh, like, like calling out from Reggie Jackson after the game last night, even on Raptors internet last night, you know, I don't even see that much when Tony brothers is calling a Raptors game and messing up in terms of direct name, uh, references to officials. So yeah, maybe Natalie Sago is not the best ref in the world. Uh, you don't need to amplify it all and continue to sort of perpetuate the, um, you know, the, the stereotypes and stigmas that surely exist for the first few women who have joined the NBA as referees. It's uh, stupid. So stop it and uh, stop worrying about refs. The Raptors got the good end of the officiating last night if we're being uh, completely real about it. So uh, stop 
like leave Natalie Sango alone. <laughs> oh my God, what are we doing? Um, anyway, Pascal Siakam did not leave the Clippers defenders alone. He was unbelievable. Uh, 31, 12, and 3 on 13 of 22 overall. Uh, fourth quarter, he only scored two points, but the bucket he did score was uh or sorry that it was in the third quarter we scored like a gorgeous bucket um in that really nice stretch where the raptors were kind of making a run before the clippers reeled them in that sort of deep back down where he got super deep position on a post up and just kind of went up and dropped it in um you know fourth quarter a little bit more, more quiet after that stretch but he was doing some good playmaking he only had three assists in this one probably should have had like six or seven working out of the zone a couple of really bad misses you know precious achua had two wide open ones that he missed that you know feel like they've been automatic lately uh obviously Precious comes back into play in a big way in this game down the stretch. But, uh, you know, Siakam against a team that was giving him a lot of trouble and a lot of, uh, you know, like actually stout defense. There's been a lot of teams that have just not had enough to actually give Pascal any problems. He really kind of solved this one and continues to be, in my eyes, an all-NBA player. He's been that good. He's been that overwhelming and that sort of, uh, you know, much of an engine for this Raptors offense. All the best stuff runs through him these days. And, uh, you know, there were moments like it goes so well down the stretch. Obviously, the play where Precious ends up getting the huge putback bucket uh, was kind of a broken play from Siakam trying to find a lob that wasn't there. But overall, just a really good job diagnosing the zone, finding opportunities with pockets where he could exploit it. And uh, overall, just a fantastic, fantastic game from a fantastic, fantastic player. Uh, a couple other quick notes. You know, Scotty Barnes, I thought in this one, his defense was a little bit iffy, but overall, I mean, he did some really, really great things. He had the dunk where he stared into Reddy Jackson's soul and yammed it. Uh, I, I Look, people might have issues with his looking back at guys on the break. I think it's cool. I think it's great. It's up there with low, low, no-look passes among the coolest things that Scotty Bars does all the time. Uh, you know, you're going to have downsides when that stuff happens, but sometimes you're going to throw down a dunk in which you've just looked into a man's soul, you know, seen his future, and then yammed and then uh you run back and continue being scotty barnes and i think the most impressive play for me in this one was in the fourth quarter mentioned pascal kind of slowed down they were doubling him quite a bit there was a lot of attention going his way as it probably should have been going and so they were kind of giving scotty some run to start creating some stuff and you know mixed results but he had the one possession where nick batum picked him up full court and Nick Batum is like, I'm, I'm pretty sure uh, our friends Mark Schindler and Nikias Duncan and Jackson Frank over at Basketball News had Nick Batum on their All-NBA team and their piece they wrote yesterday about all defense and, uh, and the Defensive Player of the Year award. Uh, Nick Batum has been incredible defensively this season. He's got incredibly active hands. He's thick. He's mean. He will be a perfect Toronto Raptor. Let's put it this way. And Scotty Barnes takes him literally 94 feet with him on his hip and walks in for a layup in a, cr in a in a clutch moment of the game pretty incredible stuff man like one of the more impressive feats that barnes has pulled off this season so even with the bad even with the, the turnover late even with a couple of miscues even with reggie jackson kind of sizing him up and cooking him in the open court uh he was essential to this game had the big tap out late and uh was awesome so so shout out to him uh, also want to give out uh, some love to Fred Van Vliet, of course, who in this game, 21 points uh, on three of nine from downtown, seven to 17 overall, not the most efficient game, but he was huge in the first half. He had 15 in the first half on five of 10. And, uh, you know, we've been talking about Fred. He, he played this one despite being a game time decision. And, you know, you can be on two sides of the coin, I suppose, in terms of do you want to play him in this stretch here while there's standing, you know, implications still on the line. Is it worth it to play him right now in the interest of getting to the postseason? Because if he's not healthy in the postseason, what does it matter anyway? It's a pretty difficult thing for the Raptors to navigate right now. And Fred himself is a guy who's not going to eagerly take a seat. And so, you know, it, it, I, I'm just hopeful they're managing it carefully. But it was nice to see Fred in there. And he did some things in the first half that, you know, he hadn't done in, in the last couple of games that he played where he was getting to the basket. He was maybe not scoring at the rim necessarily, but he was doing the Steve Nash thing, kind of probing through the paint, ended up with a couple of jumpers out of it, just kind of coming through the other side of the thicket and realizing, oh, I got some space here. I'll put up a midi. Um, you know, he, he really had a great first half overall. The playmaking wasn't quite there. I mean, the team on, on the whole, 38 field goals in this game, 14 assists. I love this team. They're stupid and ISO heavy and never pass, and it's the best. Uh, it's so fun to watch. Um, but yeah, the, the, you know, I, I thought Overall, it was a really gutsy ever from Fred. Same with Gary Trent Jr. He did not have it tonight. He was sick uh, with a non-COVID illness, just one of nine. Um, but again, when he's on the floor, things just look a lot better because the space is there. Teams are not going to just, oh, 
Gary Trent Jr. is sick today. We're not going to guard him. They're, they're, they have to guard him. And so that creates those avenues and, and driving lanes that are really, really useful. Uh, and shout out to Kem Birch as well. Really nice game from him. 21 minutes, two of two from the field, nine points overall. Got to the line a hilarious amount. Uh, led team in free throw attempts or tied for the lead with uh, with Fred Van Vliet. Had the most makes and was a plus 13 team best overall. Uh, he was really stout in, in his stretches uh, as the center for this team as well. And, you know, where he's going to work is along those lineups that have a little bit more shooting because he can kind of be that middle of the floor option. He can work in the short role, all that good stuff. Um, so yeah, really nice overall game from the Raptors. Their center play was excellent. We're going to get to the dude of the game who was also a center coming up in just one second here. But first, I want to tell you about our friends over at Bet Online. It's that time of year again as college basketball's tournament starts today. And from all the latest odds, contests, and player props, Bet Online. Dot net is the number one source for all your sports betting needs and info. Bet online remains the best spot for all your sports scores, podcasts, and news this season. And it's not just basketball. Bet online has you covered and is your continued source for all your sports wagering information needs, including live betting. You got Vegas casino games as well. If you want to put some money on your favorite upset underdog, whatever it might be, you can go and do that. You can get the lines on, hey, this is the the team I should be putting my money in as, a, as like the 12 seed that's going all the way, baby. You can also put money down on Blue Jays stuff if you want. Basket, baseball season's coming soon. The Blue Jays are amazing. Go put money on Matt Chapman winning a gold glove and Vlad Guerrero Jr. winning the MVP. All that stuff is on the table. Go put some money down on it and get rewarded for it. Uh, head to the website today. Use your mobile device. Learn more about the trends and the action. Bet online is where the game starts. And we round out your first listen of the day here with your dude of the game. And he's a guy who's been getting it a lot lately, but it's hard not to give it to him because he's been amazing. And he was essential to the Raptors winning last night. And that is, of course, Precious Achua once again. Uh, just an amazing game from Precious, who we're seeing take steps over and over. He played 27 minutes in this one. Uh, he was 5 of 7 from the field, 1 of 3 from downtown, 6 boards, 2 assists. Obviously had the massive putback late in this one. Uh, was trusted to be on the floor in crunch time over Kem Birch. He got the lion's share of the minutes over Kem Birch. If I'm going on like my ideal center rotation, 27 minutes for Achua is what I want. Kem 21 feels a little high, honestly, for, you know, where his role is going to be when they're fully healthy. But we're right now without OG, it's a perfect minute split between those two guys. They didn't mess around and go super small. They just had one of Precious or Kem on at all times to combat Hartenstein and, and Evita Zubach. And it just, it worked, man. And, and Precious is just, he's coming into his own. He had a drive and kick in this game that made me bust out a king cake baby meme like that's that's where i'm at man like it's that's that that I, just for people who aren't aware that is like the highest possible compliment you can get from me is associating you with the great works of king cake baby and precious achua did that with a beautiful driving kick to thad young in the second quarter of this game um you know it's just coming together for him man he was a minus 10 overall he was on the floor for some of those tough bench minutes where uh there just wasn't enough offense but i don't think that's necessarily a him problem like if anything he was like the second option in those lineups he did have that beautiful drive drive and take in the start of the fourth quarter during that four minute stretch that pretty pivotal four minute stretch where yeah they lost by two but they really hung tight i thought it kind of set it up for siakam and fred to carry it home afterwards um yeah just hard to get like hard to rein in the excitement over precious achua and the sort of steps he's shown because with his just baseline on defense it's there's a lot to be liked about what Precious is doing. And if he's going to add some of that off the dribble stuff and add, you know, drive and kick to his game as a compliment to his three point shooting, like you're quickly looking at a player who is a major problem for a lot of teams to deal with. So i uh, love to see it. Precious was, Precious was awesome. And uh, is clearly your due to the game. He's been racking him up lately, but rightfully so we're going to round out as well, just with a quick look at the standings, because it actually matters, you know, usually in the middle of the season standings, whatever, but we're getting down to it. And the NBA uh, like a playoff picture, the Eastern Conference playoff picture, is truly wild. So let's just give you a lay of the land of where things sit right now, and you can kind of digest it however you want. Right now, the Miami Heat feel like they're going to be the one seed. They're two games up on the Bucks at 46 and 24. That feels like it should kind of hold. They've been playing quite well. They have a very good point differential. Like at all that, all that feels very, very real. 
Uh, you've got the Milwaukee Bucks, who are 44 and 26. One last night over the Kings and kind of almost lost to the Kings. That would have made things quite interesting. Would have been three games in the loss column up on the Raptors, who are currently in seventh, and they are in second. That's incre incredible. Uh, but they're four games back in the loss column now. Then that feels like it's probably out. You're not going to catch the Bucks. Uh, the Sixers also four games in the loss column ahead of the Raptors at 42 and 26. Uh, they're three games out of first. And then in fourth, you've got the Boston Celtics, who I don't think the Raptors are going to pass. They're playing way too well right now. They have the best point differential in the Eastern Conference. They have the best net rating in the league since like January 1st. They're really, really good. It pains me to say it, but they're awesome. I don't think they're slipping back. They're probably going to end up fourth in the East and probably get home court. And I guess that opens the question of whether you want to play them or the Sixers in a first round series, potentially. If you are going to climb up the standings, I'd probably still rather the Celtics just because of the matchups and the Sixers are uh, horrifying. Uh, <laughs> but that's certainly a consideration. Then you have the Chicago Bulls, who we talked about yesterday, but it's worth mentioning again. I don't know if I talked about I might have tweeted about them yesterday. Either way, the Bulls are 41 and 28. They love they lost two in a row. They've lost seven of the last 10. And they are flailing. Their defense is not there. They are 2-16 and 16 against teams with records better than them this season. That is not good. They are not beating good teams. They are kind of... Look, I don't want to invoke this because it's unfair because DeMar DeRozan is amazing. And, you know, I don't think it's his fault that this team is having troubles right now. If anything, it's in spite of him. But they kind of feel like some of those Raptors teams from like the mid part of this decade where they racked up incredibly good net ratings and, and great records over the course of seasons. But there were always these kind of little red flags like, oh, they're like 28th in defense against good teams. Like, oh, they're like uh, well below 500 against good teams. Like th that's kind of the profile you're seeing with this Bulls team. And I think their defense leaves a lot to be desired. Uh, their defense, just to go back in that same stretch we've been talking about since February 1st, when it comes to defense, uh, let me find it here. The Raptors, sorry, the Bulls since then are not doing super well. Bear with me as basketball or as NBA.com works with me. Uh, but since that time, the Bulls are currently sporting the 20th ranked defense in the NBA and a negative net rating overall at a minus 1.0. That's a red flag, man. And I know they're doing it without Lonzo Ball right now, and he's really important to what they do. But you know, it, it, we're getting down to it. Like we're less than a month from the playoffs. Now is Lonzo going to be back? If he is, is he going to be fully hundred percent? It's hard to say, but the bulls not only are struggling, but they also have the hardest schedule in the NBA down the stretch. It is a nightmare of a schedule. And so there's a real chance here with the Raptors, two games back in the loss column, two games back overall that the Raptors pass the bulls and they could do it by Monday when the Raptors play the bulls second night of a back-to-back. -back, so it could be tough, but the Raptors are like a bazillion and two on back-to-backs this season. So maybe they stand a pretty good chance in that one. Uh, and Hey, they're a team that's been playing like the kind of team that the bulls have really struggled with this season. And, you know, I, I would be pretty okay. Taking my chances in, in a series or in, in, a, in a, in a sort of race with them for, a five or six seed. And then the Cavaliers as well. They're four and six in their last 10. Jared Allen's not there. That obviously is a big thing. He might be back for the playoffs. That's good news for him. But, uh, you know, they're, they're struggling right now. They, they got completely waxed last night for long stretches of the game by Joel Embiid and the Sixers. They made it close and they, you know, they're an annoying ass team and they, and they reeled it back in, but they did not have the juice against Joel Embiid. Evan Mobley kind of got beat up a little bit, got in foul trouble, things like that. Um, you know, it's right there for the Raptors. If they want to move up to five, like it can happen for sure. They play both the Cavs and Bulls still this season as well. Uh, so while they don't have either of the tiebreakers against them just yet, uh, it'll be even at 2-2 if they beat the Bulls and the Cavs will have it. But that's fine. If they can beat them, that's a huge, huge game in the standings. It's going to be all to play for. And it's all like next week. The Cavs, uh, the Bulls game is on Monday. The Cavs is next Thursday. Like that is going to be some big stuff for this race for the sixth and fifth seeds in the Eastern Conference. Again, I don't think it's going to be super likely the Raptors move up to four, but maybe they do. Maybe the Celtics flail as well. They're only two games up as well. So uh, it is fun as hell. It's really cool to have like high leverage March games that matter. It kind of reminds me almost of a baseball pennant race where each game really feels like it has some juice and weight. And uh, I'm having a blast. And so we will keep tabs on it, of course, down the stretch. If I'm making a prediction, do you want a prediction? I think the Raptors are going to finish fifth. I, I, I do. I think they're going to pass both the Bulls and Cavs. I think a Raptors-Celtics rematch in the first round is on tap. And that's going to be a nightmare because the Celtics are an awful, awfully difficult team to play. I think the Raptors match up decently well with them. So, you know, they're, they're, it's not going to be like a sweep or anything like that. But that is a, a team that is playing extremely good basketball right now um and yeah but i think as of right now based on how things are trending based on how the raptors are playing and you know and, and 
hoping that health comes back their way as well. Uh, I'm going to say that the Raptors are going to be the fifth seed in the Eastern Conference. And I don't think that's a crazy thing to uh, predict. And it is kind of an insane thing to think about considering where we thought things were going to be at the start of this season. But they only have 13 games left. If they can pull off a 9-4 and four down the stretch, get to 48 wins, that could very much get them number five with the way the Bulls and the Cavs are playing right now. Uh, nine and four is a lot. You don't want to just like bank that or, or pencil it in, but there's a lot of home games in the last 10 games. I think they play eight of their last 10 at home. Uh, you know, th- there's there's some wins to be picked up here for the Raptors as they are in pretty good form with now their fourth, fifth, five plus game win streak of the season under their belt. That's a good team thing, by the way. Good teams don't have four ga- four different five plus game winning streaks over the course of a season. Uh, or sorry, bad teams don't do that. Good teams do do that. And uh, maybe the Raptors are just a good team. Anyway, we are going to wrap it there. Thank you so much for tuning in to today's episode, and uh, we'll be back again tomorrow. We're going to chat with the Cavaliers of it all, or chat about the Cavaliers of it all with Chris Manning from Locked on Cavs. We're going to take a look at where they're at, why they're trending the way they are. Do they stand a chance of hanging on to that six seed with no Jared Allen? We will get into all those questions and more with Chris Manning on tomorrow's episode of the podcast. So thank you so much. We'll talk to you then. Uh, Until then, go make your second listen of the day, Locked on NBA. Highly recommended every single night, breaking down the biggest action across the league. And uh, yeah, we we, we know that uh, they're going to be talking Raptors from last night's game. I was talking to Nick Angstad, the host of the Thursday show, about it. Uh, he was He's talking Raptors, baby. So go check that out and uh, take a listen and support the show. Go to YouTube, all that good stuff. You can do that with this podcast as well. Find it on all your podcast apps for free. Uh, you can go to YouTube, subscribe to the big red subscribe button. It just says subscribe. It's screaming your name. Just go press it. And you don't have to watch the videos if you want to. Great. But if not, that's, that's fine too. Just help the numbers. Uh, <laughs> that's going to do it. We'll talk to you again on Friday with another episode of Locked on Raptors. Bye-bye. 